Let's hope this works. And I hope you all see my screen. Mm -hmm. Is that okay, Stefan? Uh, yes, certainly. Am I obscuring any of the screen here with me? Can you see the whole slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Right. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming along to this. I know how incredibly busy everybody is um, these days, and it seems that our lives are just lived online nowadays, going from one thing to another. So I do appreciate it, and I hope some of you have got your lunch with you while you listen to this, so you can take a proper break. Um, I moved to Trinity a year ago, so this feels like an appropriate moment to sort of step up and um, tell people, not just those further afield, but also those at Trinity about my story, research-wise and, and otherwise, my, my sort of thinking around a topic. And the topic of wetlands as, as nature-based coastal defences is really something that I entered in the mid-90s, and I've seen a lot of change over that time. Um, I've also had to question some of the things that I thought when I first entered into this field of research. Um, a lot of things have changed around me in, in society and our societal thinking around the, about this topic. So I hope to give you a little bit of an insight into all of those aspects. Um, and I'll divide the talk into three components broadly. I haven't really got an outline uh, slide here for you, as I'm hoping that it'll be a story that unfolds as we go through this. But broadly speaking, it'll be in three parts. So I'll start with definitions. Of course, there are a lot of words in this title here, wetlands. Not everybody might be too familiar with what I mean by that. Nature-based is a highly contented uh, term. And there are, there are people here on this call who I've recognized who've published on the meaning of nature-based solutions, um, of course, and who can talk to that much more than I can, perhaps. And then coastal defense, what do we mean by that? Um, then I'll talk about um, my story, and I'll really introduce you to my journey from the 1990s, mid-90s to the present day in my work on this topic. And then I'd like to broaden it out again. Um, as uh, Stefan has said, I'm head of department in geography. I feel passionately about the discipline of geography. And I'd like to broaden it out to really illustrate how very interdisciplinary the challenges are that lie ahead for us in this field. So these three um, components there, if you've got any questions in the chat as we go through them, I've just realized that I've sort of arranged my screen so that I can't actually see your questions, but please do um, put them in the chat as we go through and I'll try and stop every so often and see if there are any questions, perhaps twice uh, to break these three sections up. Now, the team I left behind uh, at Cambridge before I moved to Trinity, um, I very sadly left behind. And I have to acknowledge them here, of course, because they played a big role in everything I've done. This, these are just the people from the last sort of five to 10 years, perhaps. And some of them are very recent. Helen in the, Helen in the middle on the right hand side will join us in Trinity next year. Um, but the thinking that I'm going to present you with is really the result of all of those people. It's also the result of collaborations with many, many, many others on a vast range of different projects. And I'm delighted to see that some of my colleagues who were with me on these projects have also joined this call. Um, over time, you will see that there are you know, words appearing here around um, blue coast, blue carbon type uh, references, um, ecosystem services, uh, toolkits for uh, assessing particular sites, restoration, all of these terms appear in here, biodiversity and sustainability. So those are really the themes that kind of bring all of these projects together. But my um, story here began by um, looking at coastal wetlands and their role in in the mid-90s and at that time that topic did not come under the rubric of ecosystem services it also did not come under the rubric of nature-based coastal defense none of those buzzwords or natural capital none of those buzzwords existed at that time um, so when I began to look at this this is what it meant to me what is encapsulated in this slide here and um, 
I worked on the east coast of the UK. Um, many um, sea defences there are enclosing agricultural fields, which you can see on the right hand side of the slide. And then seaward on that, on the left hand side of this slide, you have extensive, sometimes very extensive wetlands, several kilometres wide in places, down to only a few metres wide that sit in front of those coastal defence lines. And of course, a lot of that is the result of reclamation historically. So that these uh, sea walls that you can see the top of here, the concrete um, topping on, on that wall, those were constructed uh, as a result of reclamation efforts that have gradually um, grabbed the land um, that was intertidal and converted it into agricultural use. On the back there of the slide, you can just see a line of old Thames uh, barges that were sunk. Uh, this is again the coast of Essex, just north of London to form an additional protection of those particular sea walls there. So it's clear that um, the sea walls themselves, once they're constructed like this, are uh, often under quite a bit of pressure, particularly when high tides and storm surges occur that cover these wetland areas. And um, that therefore the question arose as, as to how important are these wetlands in front of those sea walls. Now, you might have thought from the pictures I've just shown you that those are very flat environments. Um, well, I can tell you that they're not. <laughs> this is just a cross section across that bit of um, salt marsh that I just uh, showed you. And you can see that as you travel 200 meters from the, um, the salt marsh itself, so that's the vegetated part, I'm going back a slide here, this just the vegetation on the uh, flat surface there in front of the seawall is the green area on this plot. And then as you go seawards of that, you can see how very um, hummocky that transition onto the tidal flat is. So they're really not actually flat if you go and look at them in detail, although the overall slope is very low, you know, less than one in a hundred. Um, and, but they show a, a high bed roughness in vegetation and topography on top of that. So Coastal protection and how do we define coastal protection? Well, um, historically, coastal protection has really been about protection of people and assets. Uh, and I would um, argue that perhaps we're actually more recently moving into a slightly different way of thinking and that coastal protection also encompasses our thinking around ecosystems. But um, historically, it was around protecting people and assets. It was around uh, uh, protecting people from flooding, um, high water levels, wave impact, breaching of barriers, like you, as you can see on the right hand slides there. Uh, that was a big storm surge in 1953 that affected the North Sea. And um, any of those sea walls that had been constructed to enclose land um, really suffered at that time. They were um, also not very well constructed. And so um, the breaching of barriers really is what flooded people in that uh, January night in 1953. Um, and erosion, of course, the loss of land, the loss of the, buff of the buffer zone um, is also encompassed in that term, coastal protection, as in, in, in the way I would like to see it um, for this talk. Now, um, I showed you some slides there from 1953. So at that time, or immediately after 1953 in, in the in northwestern Europe, certainly the countries around the North Sea became very aware of this issue um, of uh, the risk to, to flooding and the risk to coastal erosion. But if you fast forward to a, a much more recent time, you will see that um, evidence that in, in government reports and such like uh, that the risk from climate change related impacts such as sea level rise and frequency magnitude of uh, storms has also become uh, you know, recognized now as a really high level um, concern. This is just from the UK climate change risk assessment here. And you'll see that uh, the flooding and coastal change risks to communities and businesses and infrastructure appear at the top level there as a risk that requires more action uh, and a risk that has a high magnitude um, into the future. It's also very interesting that the risk is formulated there as flooding and coastal change risks. While in the past, uh, the concern really has been about the risk of breaking of barriers, either uh, human constructed barriers or natural barriers. The framing is, is quite important here, I think, and we'll come back to that later. 
So what do we, what do I mean by nature-based coastal protection these days? And um, as many of you will know, I'm sure, there are a multitude of different definitions out there around, by, around what we mean by nature-based coastal protection. And I think they kind of fall into maybe three categories here. So the first one is really a, a framing of nature-based coastal protection around restoration. Um, if you take that sort of definition, then it's generally around you know, restoring something at the coast that you regard as being natural in inverted commas, and that specifically includes coastal protection as an objective as part of that restoration. The second one here is really uh, more focused around human design, engineering, construction kind of elements. And that is one where yeah, the argument is that you design or you, you create nature-based features, something that you think is something that nature would have created itself, but you give it a helping hand uh, in order to reduce coastal flood or erosion risk, for example. And you generally find those definitions in the engineering literature. Um, and then we have uh, yet another style of definition, I think, which is more um, um, an, an evaluation, emulation kind of focus around working with natural processes. So the question there is then how do you protect, restore and emulate the natural functioning of the shore in order for it, for it to fulfill uh, some service or, or, or some aim for you. And um, often that is then framed around ecosystem services, of course, as well. Now, in terms of um, the term wetland in my title, you know, we mustn't forget there is an awful lot of different types of coastal uh, environments that might be classified as wetlands, and they are often very interconnected. I specifically will be talking to you about salt marshes from the top right there, because that's where I uh, had my research focus. But a lot of the uh, ideas, theories, principles that I've uh, come across helped to develop over the years have also then applied, been applied to coral reefs and seagrass beds, mangroves, uh, beaches and dunes, um, for example. So anywhere where vegetation uh, in relation to water, Flood frequency, inundation frequency becomes important in forming a landform. I would class that all as coastal wetland. Okay, so let's move on to the second part of my talk. And I might just sort of pause to see if any, have there been any particular comments, Stefan, in the chat? No, nothing yet. Okay, we'll come back to it later. So um, I'll move on to the second part of my talk, which is really my story of, of wave dissipation evidence um, over salt marshes. My focus is on salt marshes, but the relevance is broader, I would argue. Um, so this is uh, what I embarked on 25 years ago, and I, I dug out those photographs. They kind of fell out somewhere as I was moving and unpacking boxes when I got to Dublin. So I was delighted that I still had them all in black and white, not that colour wasn't possible in 1994 or whenever this was. Um, but you'll see that basically I embarked on a, on a physical geography PhD that involved constructing uh, something that looks like a far too oversized um, equipment holding tower, which was placed on the salt marshes and the tidal sand flats um, in, in North Norfolk with wires coming out of it and I had to harness myself and climb up and down the ladder there to digitally um, to download into a laptop in my backpack the data from uh, pressure sensors that were placed onto the marsh and the tidal flat surface to record waves when the tide came in. Um, and where did this happen? So this is the coast of Norfolk there is just north of London as you see the map on the left hand side there. Uh, facing northeast, you have a very, very high fetch distance here. So the, the waves can come all the way from um, Scandinavia, from Spitsbergen, basically over several hundreds of kilometers. And therefore, the wave energy levels are here potentially very high, particularly when you get storm surges. Um, and we placed three um, measurement stations over on the, the sand flat and the salt marsh in the, the black triangles on there. Uh, that's roughly what the surface there looked like. So again, you know, not entirely flat because there's a lot of microtopography there. 
Um, and the idea really was that when the sand flat uh, and salt marsh gets um, becomes inundated through uh, uh, the, the tides or uh, elevated tides, if you get the storm surge, you have um, the waves giving you a circular water motion underneath uh, the water level. And that motion is what stresses the bed and that's what can erode the bed. And um, that's also what can erode uh, sea walls and uh, sea defences that lie further landwards. So anything that reduces that orbital motion of the water underneath the waves um, is helpful. And vegetation does that by uh, introducing drag around obstacles, um, by being an obstacle sorry, around which drag is induced. And that drag uh, converts the energy of the waves into friction, turbulence, um, and um, slowing down the current, and therefore you know, less erosion can happen. Uh, and this provides the first evidence for the effect of mixed vegetation species type salt marshes on waves. There was some work done in the United States on Spartina only marshes. It's just one particular species of uh, salt marsh vegetation uh, in very, very low water depths and um, only with a couple of uh, measurements of waves sent over them artificially by boat, I think, at the time that was um, the case. So here we measured waves over many, many, many different tides. And each of those little dots on that diagram is a separate tide with, with separate wave conditions. So you have on the x-axis the water depth and on the y-axis the percentage energy loss or gain, whereby the energy loss um, is greater the more you go down. Uh, so that's a kind of an inverted uh, y-axis here if you're talking about energy loss. So the black dots quite clearly are all lying below the uh, diamonds and the black dots were all the data that I recorded over the salt marsh and the diamonds over the sand flat. This is the same distance between the stations um, and you can then isolate. So the argument could be, well, you're not measuring over the same water depth because you're going up the slope as you're measuring over the salt marsh. Um, that is refuted by the fact that you actually have enough data here for similar water depths. So if you look at those yellow, these orange lines between them, then there's clearly a difference. So that provided the first evidence that salt marsh vegetation was really important in uh, reducing the energy of waves as they travel towards the shore. We then um, advanced the technology on this and we um, ran a number of projects that you can see in the bottom diagram here with lots more, you know, up to 14 pressure sensors deployed across a, a salt marsh surface. And if anybody wants any more detail about the tech around the technology of this, I'm more than happy to talk about that in the question and answer session later. But that really gave us um, a lot more data um, and a lot more information on the influence of water levels, for example, and the influence of wave height itself and on the influence of the type of marsh vegetation as well. So here you can see a diagram at the bottom, seawall on the left and the um, open ocean on the right hand side. The wave um, energy coming in here is plotted on the y-axis. You can see in the far right hand diagram a, a big spread there um, in terms of different wave heights coming in from the ocean. And as they come in over the tidal flat and the salt marsh, you will see that they all, whatever they are, they all reduce in energy by the time they, re they hit the seawall. Um, and therefore, that profile, that coastal profile over the mudflat and the salt marsh acts as a really important buffer against the wave's energy. But particularly the salt marsh uh, leads to an enhanced reduction. You can see all these curves are going down rapidly when the waves reach the vegetated surface. So that's a, a long story. Um, in terms of the detail around that, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer questions later on this. Um, but basically, the question that remained was, well, uh, you know, we know that the vegetation, the vegetation is important, but we have all our measurements conducted in uh, relatively low water depths, just your average kind of tidal inundation of those wetlands and, um, and not during a storm surge. So the thing about these wetlands is that they, then, they do tend to get covered by water um, every um, two week on two week periods um, during every spring tide, uh, but they uh, don't get covered in a lot of water unless you get a storm surge. And of course, it's during a storm surge that you want to measure their performance as a coastal defense. Um, 
So uh, we thought, well, okay, where can we go to get data during a storm surge? And we thought, right, let's go to the Baltic Sea. The Baltic Sea is highly prone to storm surges. Um, it's a relatively enclosed basin. So if you get a low atmospheric pressure, travel across it, uh, it lifts the water level up and, um, and gives you a meter, two meters of water above the salt grasslands that grow there. So it's not quite the same vegetation, not quite the same um, environment as on the North Sea coast, but a little bit more predictable in terms of you know, what, when you can get storms and capturing storms in the winter. So um, we went there, we'd heard that uh, ice could be an issue in the winter months, um, but that the Baltic in that area had been ice free for about 10, 15 years prior to our experiment. So we set up all of our measurement equipment there. And um, as luck would have it, that very year, we got a, a phenomenal um, ice storm that trashed all of our equipment. So we had really high water levels, we had really energetic waves, um, we had ice on top of the waves and we weren't able to record anything because our equipment was completely um, destroyed. So this is the fun and games you have to play when you're trying to capture extreme events um, in real time. So we had to rethink. Um, and of course, what do you do if you can't um, take the storm to the salt marsh and measure it? Uh, the, the only other option really is to take the salt marsh to the storm. And uh, so we were looking around for where we could generate a storm and how on earth we could take a salt marsh or a coastal wetland to that storm. And we found the um, large wave bloom facility in Hanover in Germany, which is a um, really impressive engineered installation. It's over 300 meters long, um, it's seven meters deep and five meters wide. And it has a wave paddle at the end that allows you to simulate completely accurately what we would call a John Swap wave spectrum, which is the spectrum you expect in somewhere like the North Sea during um, a storm that blows for an extended period of time. So um, then the problem was, how do we get the salt marsh to the storm, the, the artificial storm, so to speak? And we thought, um, OK, well, we'll try it on with the uh, German Wadden Sea um, authorities. And it, they happened to be planning seawall construction works. And they were very kind and they actually dug up uh, a bit of salt marsh for us in an area that um, didn't have a, didn't leave behind too much of an ecological um, problem. So we put that salt marsh on two articulated lorries. We carted it to Hanover and we put it into the flume. And I don't know if this video is playing for you, but um, if it is, a second in this video is an hour in reality. So this took um, a long time to assemble the, the salt marsh in the way that we had excavated it. And obviously it had to come in, in individual little blocks. But we ended up with a very realistic representation of uh, the, the natural setting and in a controlled environment so that we could um, precisely simulate the storm surge and uh, look, also look at uh, two different water level effects and uh, the effects of different types of waves um, over the top of the, the salt marsh. The aim here was really just to quantify very precisely what the effect of the vegetation would be um, on, the, on the marsh. Um, and we really had not expected to have to rescue several um, families of mice in the process that all started to swim for their lives when we finally put the uh, the, the relocated salt marsh underwater but um, you know there was a little bit of a cost to this I don't think any of them actually died uh, but anyway so um, the results of this were um, really startling for us because we, um, we we knew that the salt marsh was efficient in reducing the energy of the waves but we hadn't quite expected that under two meters of water so this data is <clears throat> for the runs that we did when we put the salt marsh under two meters of water, which is extreme water levels by any stretch of, of what we knew had historically taken place over the marshes around northwestern Europe. Um, and you can see here the, the amount of wave height reduction we measured over the 40 meter long salt marsh section for different types of waves that are listed on the x axis here. So uh, for example, I've plotted on here for a 40 centimeter high wave, um, the plants themselves uh, reduced 
the um, the wave the, well, the the platform with the plans we use the wave height by around fifteen to twenty uh, percent over that distance, and we then mowed the platform. We took all the plants off. We did that very carefully and all by hand, uh, and reran the same tests or at least a subset of them. And we discovered that just the plants themselves reduced the uh, or, or accounted for 60% of that uh, reduction in wave height. We also found that the biomass, the plants on the platform, remained extremely stable. So there was a little bit of loss of dead plant material in the process. And these are really significant uh, storm conditions. It was it's so incredible that we were surprised that the platform actually stayed intact. But the vegetation was remarkably uh, resilient to those forces. Uh, we looked at the vegetation under the plants under water through the window in the flume, and um, we could see that they were bending over, you know, up to 61 degree um, angles. And we were really surprised that they didn't break the stems. Most of the, st the stems didn't break at the base of the platform. Very little biomass loss, as you can see in the bottom diagram there. But we were we learned a lot from that. We learned um, a lot of detail around how the plants move, you know, the physics of them, the flexibility of different parts of the leaves, and we also uh, went and measured the bed levels uh, on the platform before and after each experimental run, uh, and that's meticulous work. We had to lower down a platform on top of the the, the salt marsh base without in any way touching the base because we wanted it to be as intact as possible. So there were kind of supports built into the construction. And then we lowered these little pins that you can see in the top photograph before and after each experiment in absolutely precisely the same millimeter accurate location so that we could work out uh, by how much the surface had become eroded in the process. We looked at different species of salt marsh plants, Elymas, Atroplex, and Fuxinellia, under that. And um, we discovered that the salt marsh is remarkably um, resistant. So when we, when we mowed the platform at the end of the experiments, uh, we were able to then see the exposed surfaces as well and look at erosion features that were there. But we saw very, very little, absolutely minimal elevation change. Um, and that's plotted in, in that graph over there, which is um, was published in 2015. So there's a slight variation between the different species, AEP and bare surface here, uh, but the elevation change is really minimal, it's of, of the order of you know, a few millimeters um, over the whole of the week of, of storms. Now, the remaining questions from that then um, became kind of slightly reorientated from the original question. The original question was really, how important are these coastal wetlands, uh, that, that, or for example, a salt marsh wetland as a coastal protection feature in terms of reducing waves? The question then really became, okay, we know they are very important at reducing waves. They're very um, efficient at doing that. But really, you know, when and how does the marsh start to erode? When and how does that happen? Because we didn't really see it happen in that experiment in Hanover. But we knew, and there's a picture here that I've taken in the field, we knew that there's evidence in the field that the salt marsh plants excavate themselves under uh, a lot of um, high energy conditions. You can see that they're being swirled around by the waves and then, then pulled up and that leads to marshes eroding. So does that only happen when they grow individually and not in a big canopy like we had reconstructed? I mean, how resistant is the material? What does that depend on? And, and what about future sea level rise and climate scenarios if indeed there is um, a way by which salt marshes can erode? We didn't see that erosion in the flume, but we can see it in the field. And there's a lovely picture here taken by James Tempest, um, who's shown in that photograph, who's got a fantastic name for this kind of <laughs> research. Um, and he um, he did, uh, he, he took this photograph here as one of the salt marshes on the um, East Coast was starting to uh, go underwater during a really high energy wave event. And you can see the waves breaking against the marsh edge there. Now that marsh edge would not form naturally like that. Um, coastal wetlands form on a gentle slope. So something has happened there. The, the, 
probably the um, intertidal area in front of the vegetated zone has become eroded and then you can see the erosion happening um, almost as you speak in this photograph. So um, a couple of projects followed, they're called the resist projects, there's a pair of them and you can see by the um, uh, symbols we are using there in the top left that one of them is really about erosion on the flat surface and the other one was really about wave erosion at the edge uh, as you can see in that photograph. Um, and so the question then becomes, well, you know, what kinds of forces produce these types of erosion features? And are those forces going to become more prominent in the future? Um, we have, I have a number of PhD students at the moment who are still looking at this um, and analysing the data from this. This is Olivia Shears here, um, who's in her third year now, and um, she's just probing some of the, the sedimentary material there to bring it back to the lab and to measure the shear strength of that. We also had a follow-up um, European Union project in that big wave flume uh, and this time you can see that there's a lot going on in here but it's um, really of a kind of slightly different character so we had a lot of um, uh, experimental platforms that are flat and on them we put different kinds of species and they're very sparsely seeded and sparsely planted so that we can start to look at some of the, the questions around thresholds of erosion around individual stems. So the remaining questions we have from that are really now you know not no longer well the, the top questions here are the ones that um we were left with after the first experiment and that we have some answers to now, although I can't really tell you about them because I haven't, we haven't published them just yet. Uh, but the remaining questions from that are then uh, how long before the vegetation recovers once it um, is, is eroded or it suffers uh, physical stress. That's really what came out of the uh, Hanover experiment. The, the latest one is that the individual plants do break um, and that they then do need to regrow from their stems. Uh, but also, how does the increase in the frequency of high energy events affect the growth of the marsh in, into the future? You know, so really, scaling this up to the longer term uh, remains a question that we have. Um, we also managed to bridge uh, some of the sort of linkages between our science and the policy. So it was interesting to see that by the time we got to our second experiment, uh, some of the results from the first experiment really made it into um, an, a big policy document in the UK, and that was the uh, adaptation, the climate adaptation subcommittee uh, progress report in 2013, um, where the climate change committee stated that really the cost of coastal protection is likely to increase um, by a very large amount to 200 million uh, pounds each year by 2030. And that was a 30% increase on the spending levels at the time. But not only that, they also then took our um, evidence and um, put out this statement that really what, what needs to happen is a 10% restoration effort of 10% of lost coastal buffer zone um, by 2030 in order to um, reduce the cost that would be required to be spent that, um, on coastal protection. Um, and um, that might then cost 10 to 15 million a year until 2030. But the long term savings on defense costs would be 180 to 380 million pounds. So it was the first time that we really kind of saw this, this scientific evidence being then translated into economic figures. And it's something that I'm so really interested in. Um, and of course, we then need to add to this. Uh, and I think this is where I want to take my last part of this talk. Um, is really the, the shift that we are seeing in society towards a, a recognition of the wider environmental benefits of coastal protection schemes. Um, and, and of course, when you factor that in, then the, the cost or the, the benefit that you derive from these types of uh, schemes rockets up. So there are a key series of challenges, I think, that I can highlight um, at the end here that will lead us perhaps to a really interesting discussion for us to have. Um, and that is, I think, there are there, there are three key elements that um, that we need to think about. Maybe not just as challenges, also as opportunities, perhaps. And the first one is that there is an inherent dynamism, I think, in the coastal zone that is really essential to support its function 
So what I've seen in my work over the last 25 years is that this, the, the role of this, more, what we call the morphodynamic feedback as physical geographers and geomorphologists, that the shape of the coast instantly affects water levels and waves, which is what we're benefiting from when we're using coastal wetlands as coastal protection features. But that the effect of the waves um, and water level then has a lagged effect, of course, on the shape of the coast. So anything that becomes eroded will be deposited somewhere else. And um, I'll give you an example of that in a minute. And human dependency is another uh, one of those challenges and or opportunities. Um, and I'll give you an example of that in a minute. And inherent uncertainty. So I think these are the, the three key uh, challenges slash opportunities. And I'll go through them one by one here. So on the natural dynamic processes, um, it was really interesting for me to send um, my postdocs and PhD students out to relocate some instruments that we'd inserted in the tidal flats in Morecambe Bay um, about 10 years earlier. And when they got there, they found that these instruments that were flush with the surface of the tidal flats those 10 years before had actually become exposed and the surface had become eroded down by about a metre and a half or so. So clearly it's possible for tidal flats to erode by that extent in a relatively short period of time. Um, but what is important to remember is that what is erosion in one place is accretion in another. And um, that has caused a real headache when we think about restoration conservation efforts um, elsewhere and it's a, a nice little example here with a bit of a not very helpful slide but what you can see there and um, where it says Benica NNR that's Benica Ness on the east coast of the UK it's a natural uh, national nature reserve and the hashed area the, the light green hashed area um, is that outline that area of the the protected area of the natural nature reserve um, and then it also is a triple SI, so it's a site of special scientific interest, which is that thinner, darker green hashed area. But you can see that the dunes and the, um, and the beach environments there have migrated over time out of that area. And you can see evidence of that by the um, bit of sand that kind of sticks out in the north to the north of where it says Pakefield to Eastern. And actually, that is already still some a little bit out of date, and the feature has migrated further to the north um, as we speak now. So actually, the areas that are designated to protect this feature are no longer the areas where that feature resides, the dunes and the, uh, the beach environment. So uh, bringing this a little bit closer to home and to salt marsh settings, uh, I don't know how many of you are aware that in the UK, this uh, land grabbing from the sea, effectively, this um, reclamation effort that um, was common up until the 1970s, actually, has been reversed in some parts in order to restore some of the coastal wetlands. And this is a classic example here at Freeston in the Wash in the UK, where um, the seawall has been breached again in the three places, by uh, demarcated by the three arrows here. Um, and as a result of that breaching, the um, agricultural land flooded with the tides again. But when the tides empty from that uh, site, they erode the surfaces. Um, and this is clearly something that hadn't happened before. So over the natural surfaces now, and this is again not terribly clear on this slide, but if you focus on the right hand side here, you can see three elongated photographs there, 1999, 2001, and 2003. These are photographs of one of the, the channels, the creeks that comes out of that restoration site. And, they, and that creek has widened from three meters to nearly 14 meters over only four years as a result of that intervention. And a lot of the natural salt marsh that was existing either side of that creek obviously got lost as a result of that erosion. It's a completely unintentional effect, sorry, but it um, illustrates this morphodynamic feedback. You intervene, you do something, it has a, a feedback effect, and that sediment then goes somewhere else. Um, and you need to be aware of that. Challenge number two uh, is that I, I think we, um, we have become much better at recognizing the importance of coastal wetlands, not just as coastal protection features, but also um, to sustain the lives and livelihoods of people. Um, nowhere more so perhaps than in the developing 
uh, part of, of the world where often very small communities rely on these environments entirely for their living uh, in terms of the fishing um, uh, that, that, is, that, that happens within those spaces. Um, and then you have the kind of conflict of, well, if you look at Northwestern Europe and you look, you look at um, the UK, you know, it's, it's salt marsh is being used to graze lamb, which is used to provide us with crisps. So you have this kind of human dependency and, and luxury kind of question. And the second one is um, really who benefits from uh, the existence of coastal wetlands. And there's a lovely example of Wallasey Island Wild Coast Project here on the east coast of the UK, highly manicured uh, salt marsh um, under the uh, restoration efforts of the uh, Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Um, and it was really marketed as something that provides valuable habitat for wildlife now and under a range of future sea level and climate conditions. Um, but the question here is, well, you know, it depends really who you speak to and it depends who the RSPB seems to speak to as to which benefit of this very landscaped coastal wetland is highlighted. Um, and this is in another quote here, that if the Wild, the Wild Coast project had not been constructed, there would be a very real risk that future storm surge would breach the existing sea defences. So there's different kinds of slogans, different marketing strategies used. And of course, it's, if you look at what had to be done here to um, reinstate coastal wetland where it was once you know, reclaimed from the sea, uh, animals that had actually been um, using that agricultural land had to be relocated. And you have these really artificial structures that are there designed to support very specific species. So you end up with a very, very um, controlled artificial coast even though it is arguably restored and is arguably being, being used to uh, protect the shore. Um, and I think all around this, you still have all of these uncertainties. You still have sea level rise. You still have uncertain wind wave surge conditions. You still have human intervention that is unregulated. Um, and so these, these, all these uncertainties really lead us to challenge three, and that is that ultimately... Anything we do at the coast, whether it's a nature-based coastal protection or anything else we intervene with, um, is still extremely, we're still really struggling with predicting the effect um, of that. And there is this lovely quote here by Lao Tzu um, from a long, long time ago. Um, that, you know, you're almost, uh, then the reaction would be to retreat and to say, well, you know, we know so much that actually we know that we can't predict. And then what do we do? Well, one suggestion is that we uh, use a risk-based coastal protection um, approach. So we basically create maybe coastal wetland in front of a seawall, um, or we retreat the seawall, and then we think about different actions we can take in order to stepwise reduce the risk. Now, if we do that, ecosystems are really components in a risk reduction strategy. Um, but if we look at the challenge we're facing with um, some of the coastal development that's happened in the last um, 50, 60 years or so, you know, we're having sand barriers, for example, like this, that are then developed like that. We have 200 million people at risk of coastal flooding globally. Um, we have sea level rise. We have a phenomenal challenge ahead of ourselves. And um, I think we can take some... Um, so comfort in the fact that we that perceptions are changing around the the, the coastal spaces. Um, and there are some lovely quotes here that I haven't got time to go into. But you know, all the way from the eighth to the to the nineteenth um, century, coastal wetlands have been seen as wastelands and as wilderness that you better be off staying away from. Uh, dreary regions with half savage populations. There in the bottom quote. Um, amphibious life uh, that is not desirable and now actually you know we're looking at wetlands in a very very different light we're starting to see the benefits of them um, we're even trying to bring wetland research to people and getting uh, the public involved and appreciating it a bit more so we have a huge uh, challenge but I think also we have a massive opportunity as is so often the case um, we have a situation where human Actions, adaptations have a close link to the hazards that the humans experience. 
coastal dynamics sits in there and brings with it opportunities. Those are, that's a natural process side of things. And we also have uh, huge challenges on the social and economic side of things in managing these interactions. And I think, uh, you know, ultimately, that's where our policies for sustainable development need to be at the coast. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be uh, giving this talk as the head of the Department of Geography if I didn't think that geography can play a fantastic role um, within all of this. So really, just to kind of end, end on that note, that I, you know, I think, I hope that I've made you realise that true natural coastal protection perhaps is the way forward in some shape or form. This mostly the lowest risk, the lowest cost gives you the highest resilience, the largest and longest benefit, but I would say arguably is also the toughest to implement because it raises some really seriously serious uh, societal questions. So thank you. I've rambled on far too long here. That's great. Thank you, Iris. Um, I believe we had some questions in the chat. Okay. Um, right, so I'm going to go through them then. Um, so, someone was boiling a kettle, some interference in the sound. Okay, I'm making a way down there. Um, how does the attenuation compare to beaches, sand, gravel, boulders, and of course, rock platforms? Has anyone looked into that? Um, yes, uh, they have looked into that. Um, I think the problem with, um, with boulders and rocks and so on is that the attenuation is largely achieved through either reflection of the rocks or um, refocusing of the waves energy around them and that then scours them so there is probably more attenuation around boulders and rock platforms for example um and core structures but if you think about what people have done on beaches in order to protect what lies behind you know, it's generally coarse um riprap uh structures and so on and they then the reflection of the hard surfaces often causes erosion over time and then uh, loss of beach material. So that is not the case in salt marshes or a coastal wetlands generally where you have much more cohesive uh, sediment and where the vegetation offers a kind of buffered layer over the whole of the uh, base substrate. Um, can you differentiate wave attenuation by the reduced water depth on the marsh from the impact of vegetation? Uh, yes, you can. Absolutely. Yes. So the water depth, this, this is a question around the fact that when you have uh, shallower water depth, then the waves will break, of course, and that itself will reduce um, the energy of the waves. But yes, you can differentiate that. In all of our experiments, we made sure that the waves were not breaking so that all of the dissipation we measured was just due to the vegetation. So we know that it wasn't a shallow water effect. Did you seek to compensate the forcibly displaced mice, you monster? Yes, I did. Um, they were all uh, taken out by the children of the researchers who were very concerned about this. They were dried under a nice heat lamp and then they were led out into the local forest. And I think they probably lived happily ever after. So, so thank you, Maeve. Um, what are the effects of anthropogenic activity, for example, plastics or water quality or dog walking effects on what so the effects on the ecology um, are great I and mean, largely the coastal wetlands are used either um, to graze when you have salt marshes or for farming in, in mangroves of course it's fish farming um, and, and so on but in on salt marshes it's grazing and grazing has a big effect um, on the the salt marsh because it compacts the surface and it doesn't allow it to keep pace with sea level rise, for example, in terms of its growth. How do we get political will in Ireland to invert to invest in nature-based solutions? Are there lessons to learn from the UK? Yes, um, I think so. There is, there is. I think there is a um, 
uh, an issue here in that I think we need to be a little bit more creative in how we think about nature-based solutions. And I was hoping that that might come across in some of what I said, that we, we think about the additional add-on benefits that we get by implementing nature-based solutions because um, we tend to think very short term, uh, we tend to think very short term on the political and planning horizon, but if we actually think about societal benefits over longer time scales and factor the true costs in, then um, you know, maybe perhaps that, you know, that can screen um, the argument for nature-based solutions around that way. Uh, do particular species of plants with particular traits play a role in coastal wetlands or is it a diversity of species important? Um, yes um, and no. So it depends as to what what do you mean it's important for, but for uh, wave dissipation, it... Um, it does matter. Uh, it, if you think about uh, some plant species are more flexible and they move more with the waves. So we found, for example, that Elymas, which is one of the salt marsh species, is relatively flexible. So if you have a salt marsh that just consists of, of Elymas, um, it will flatten during the action of the wave and it provides less resistance uh, to, to the, the progression of the waves across it. Um, and if you have species like Spartina, for example, that are more rigid, that will stand up um, taller in the vegetation, then um, they might be a bit more efficient. However, they also may be more uh, susceptible to breakage during extreme events. And that's what we looked at in the Hanover experiment of late, which um, the results haven't been published on, but I can sort of tell you that much for now. Uh, the dynamic environments, do you see remote sensing as being a key factor in understanding and management? Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. That's a great question. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think the, the, the issue is that the dynamism, I hope I've indicated, is really important for the sustainability, if you like, or the, the resilience of coastal landforms. And the only way we can learn to live with that is if we uh, observe the dynamic change that happens and then respond to it. I think what we really need is a shift from um, an, an attitude of thinking that we can control the natural dynamism to an attitude of thinking that we have to live with it and actually benefit from it. But we can only do that if we, if we can observe that dynamism and try to be one step ahead of it so that we can try to learn from the dynamism of the past and then predict where it's likely to go in the future. That is only possible through uh, the application of uh, monitoring and remote sensing plays a really important part in that. Nature 2000 designations, do they inhibit or support adaptation solutions? Um, um, well, they have. They have been helpful in that it has given conservation organizations a, um, a legal uh, reason for intervening or for making a particular case or argument for, for restoration. I do think there's a fundamental problem with Natura 2000 and with other uh, designations as well. And that is that they do not accommodate the dynamism that we need to accommodate. So um, I think really there is a Maybe the Green Deal, the EU's Green Deal um, plans now, and this, that is really an opportunity to highlight the fact that we need to learn to live with a dynamic coastal environment. How do we get political will? Um, okay, uh, we have that. Be interesting to look at DEMs of different volumetric changes of high resolution LIDAR data that are available. Yes, it would be, absolutely. Do get in touch. That sounds um. That is absolutely something that I would be interested in doing. Um, and then people have to leave. <laughs> I think, so that's probably it. I think I've covered everybody's 